Hey everyone, this is Francis Caballo from Social Media Just for Writers, and Kevin just came on the air, and he started the broadcast, so I... I didn't mean to, to. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. There you are. <laughs> so happy. So happy. Look what I'm wearing. Oh, look at you. Look at I'm you. I didn't even wear a draft digital, digital book. That I picked up at the San Francisco Writers Conference. I looked and looked for Kevin and could not find him. So, yes, I'm sorry about that. I was looking for you too, actually. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how we missed each other in all that crowd. <laughs> yeah, well, I went to the table a couple times, and I have proof that I was looking for you. Yes, so this is thank the you. This draft to digital logo for everyone who doesn't know. And right. we're here today with Kevin Tellinson. I didn't even ask you for a bio, but I can tell you that he is the marketing director for draft to digital and a blockbuster and best-selling author. And he's going to talk yes. about draft to digital as well as marketing tips today, which is something that we can all use, I can use. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. I Apparently I'm a, an accidental presentation starter, too. I did not mean to do that. I was just, a button popped up right as I was clicking on something. <laughs> so we didn't get a chance to chat or anything. <laughs> That's, that's great. That's great. So that's I am fine. so happy to have you here today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and I, I love your podcast. Well, thank you. I'm yeah. happy to hear you're a listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very, you have a very easygoing voice and nature. It's, it's a very natural cadence that you have. Well, thank you. And so, yeah. I grew it myself. <laughs> Chortle. Listen to me, Chortle. Okay. So, <laughs> I got you to Chortle on air. That is fine by me. I can live with that. Yeah. <laughs> Bucket list. All right. Check oh, that yeah. off. That means everyone else can hear it, too. Oh, well. So <laughs> you're going to be talking about marketing tips, but I thought we would start off the conversation by just talking about draft, draft to digital and talking yes. about, you know, I know it as a company that, that uploads books to several services retailers for authors, but tell me about the services that draft to digital offers. Okay, um, so forced, forced. I just made up an, a word on air, and I'm, a, I'm an author. That means it's a real word now. Um, but first and foremost, uh, we are, like as you described, we're an aggregator. Uh, that's our sort of primary service, so you would upload your manuscript to us. We have an incredible um, service that that will convert that manuscript to uh, EPUB and MOBI and PDF formats. Uh, the uh, EPUB and MOBI formats, that's what goes out to the various uh, ebook distributors. And then we'll push that book out for you. We have a lot of nice little free tools built into the service. Actually, everything we do is free, but we have some really cool free tools built into the service that make it easy for you to convert your manuscript and distribute it. That's our primary business. Right. I apologize. I'm in an RV, by the way, and you're hearing a lot of road noise, <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> I don't hear it. Okay, good. I shouldn't have called it out then. That, the RV is something that we'll get into. I have, I have questions yes. about your present living situation. So now there are other uh, companies that, that aggregate ebooks the way your company does, and so I'm wondering how draft to digital distinguishes itself. I mean, it's 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 tough to distinguish yourself if you're just going line for line uh, describing us in in some sort of rope manner because uh, you know there is smash words. I'm going to go ahead and mention these competitors. Okay, uh, we don't even really consider them competitors. They're just they're in the same business as us. But there is smash words. There is pronoun, and these guys uh, do a, a similar service. Um, they'll convert your manuscript. They'll distribute it. We. Uh, we like to think that one of the ways we differentiate ourselves is with our customer service team, which is a you know a group of real live humans uh, who are just pretty much standing by to answer questions and help you through rough patches. Um, we get we get kudos on that from people constantly, so I know that that's a big draw. Um, we're also you know we're a, we're built you know we're founded by both authors and software developers so we're constantly building new tools uh, that are designed to help authors um, make an author's life easier basically uh, so the, these are the sort of, they're subtle ways um, because in the end 
you know, one aggregator is very much like another. Uh, so we chose to stand out in, in how we serve the community. So we're very service oriented. We're, and when I say that, I don't mean uh, strictly in the technology sense. I mean, we are a very service oriented company. We were founded by authors. You know, I'm an author. Uh, Aaron Pogue, one of our one of our founders, is an author. Uh, I mean, my own father uses this service. I mean, we're we're very much oriented towards helping independent authors succeed. So that sounds like the uh, beauty pageant answer, but it is the truth. <laughs> That's an interesting analogy. So. I happened to experience that level of customer service because for some reason there were some issues when I uploaded my book and yeah. I, I received completely outstanding customer service and that would be, I mean we've talked about smash words, I love smash words, but there is the yeah. meat grinder to get through and it right. can be difficult for non Just the name, people. the meat grinder, is enough to put me off. <laughs> You know, there's, I have screenshots, et cetera, that just don't do well with the meat grinder. Although I did get one book through Smashwords. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so I experienced really tremendous customer service. And I don't mean, mean to be a commercial or be on the soap opera box. No, I, I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. I was amazed by the customer service. I was having some issues, and I shouldn't have had the issues, but I was having them. And uh, whoever is on your team there, they just took it out of my hands, thank God, and they yeah. took care of it. So I was really yeah. pleased. I hadn't experienced that before. So, Well, that's so that's what we do. Yeah. yeah. And it, the thing is, it, it, we couldn't, you know, we make that claim that we're here to make the author's life easier. That That's sort of part of our brand. Um, and it's really tough to make that claim when you're, you know, kind of washing your hands of everybody and trying to just push them off to the side. You know, we've had lots of people... Uh, will come to us and sometimes the problems are uh, you know something has gone wrong in conversion or something like that or it's you know the author doesn't fully understand uh, what they're what they're working on they they've made a mistake themselves and uh, we'll fix that too it's just um, it's kind of the human decency thing like we we believe humans should help other humans and uh, particularly you know we believe that authors and and people servicing authors should help other authors and so that's that's just the way we've always operated from day one I mean that's just been the, the that was the thing actually that attracted me to the company in the first place um, back you know I didn't start with these guys until August 2016 so it hasn't really been that long uh, but I was an advocate for them long before that <laughs> I was out uh, pimping and pushing these guys well before they were giving me money for it. So, if that tells you anything. Yeah. Oh, so you have been there a short time. Yeah, uh, I started, like I say, August 2016. I had um, I had interviewed uh, Dan Wood on my my podcast. Uh, I had met with him a couple of times, or at least once, at a convention. Uh, we'd had some chats back and forth, and I. I had mentioned to him uh, sort of a, a change in lifestyle, which you know we we can talk about, but uh, that I was going to have, and I at the time was writing, uh, doing a lot of copywriting work, and really kind of wanted to call that down because I was I was you know I, I was seeing a rise in my uh, publishing income, um, and the marketing work I was doing for clients was kind of supplemental to that. But I was writing things for like oil and gas companies and food service industry and that sort of thing, and it wasn't really my passion. Uh, so I wanted to become more, much more involved, even more so than I was. I wanted to become much more involved in the world of the indie publisher and uh, draft to digital. I, I could not think of a better company uh, to, to, you know, to align with that mission. That's exactly their mission. Uh, so it was just a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, I kind of uh, pitched the idea, and then they came. They came to me with an offer, knowing full well what you know what I was all about. So it was hard to turn away. I mean, and it's an incredible company. I've, I've never been happier working for anybody. And I don't well, particularly cool. like working for people most of my life. <laughs> yeah. So you had a copywriting business. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, forgive me for taking sips of tea. As That's you can tell, I've got kind of a throat thing going. Um, yes, I have a, um, or ha well, I, te I technically still have it, but uh, I am a, uh, I'm an award-winning copywriter. I've been doing this work for years. Um, I've had stuff, you know, 
uh, especially video work that I've helped with, uh, you know, has played in the White House and uh, I've won awards and that sort of thing. And it was a great career and I could have kept it going indefinitely, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, you know, it is a bit taxing and it isn't quite the kind of writing I wanted to do for a living. So uh, I was more than happy to kind of trade that for, for a little something closer to uh, my dreams and goals. <laughs> so, but yeah, copywriting is actually uh, a big part of my life still uh, because I, I kind of coach authors in copywriting. I do some, um, I still do a, little, a bit of copywriting for a few big name authors. Uh, I do like their book descriptions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I'm kind of working with a few authors on teaching them sort of the the basics of using copywriting to help improve their marketing. So that's a ongoing thing for me as well. That's a valuable skill to have. Yeah, you know, it's you, it's my staple skill. <laughs> yeah, because and because I, I know that one area that I fall I fell down on I fall down on is when I write my book description for Amazon or for Draft to Digital wherever right. it's going. And I know that that is probably my weakest feature as a writer. Right. And yeah. how those copywriting, I need to sign up with you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Oh we'll God. talk. I do a referral-only network now, but you can certainly be a part of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, copywriting um, in particular is a, it's a difficult bra brain shift to make because we are creative writers. You know, copywriting is creative as well, but... The, the targets and goals of your writing shift when you are copywriting versus, uh, well, just for the sake of clarity, we'll just say uh, creative writing, even though all writing is, you know, essentially creative. Um, copywriting ha is a specific skill you apply in order pr to promote your work. Um, draft to digital, uh, you know, we don't provide services like that, but, you know, we, we encourage people to find... Um, if you don't have copywriting as a skill set, a subset of your writing skills, go out and find someone who can do that for you because it, it actually makes a big impact on um, moving your books. Because um, it's essentially sales copy. You know, it, it's it's promoting your work to a reader. That's its goal. Uh, the goal of copywriting is always persuasion. And uh, you're persuading someone to pick up your book for the first time and crack it open. And that's, that's tricky. Uh, it's a different skill. So... It's not something you have to do yourself. Uh, there are lots of copywriters out there, and the recommendation is just like finding editors or cover designers, that sort of thing. You know, Draft to Digital recommends finding a decent copywriter to handle your marketing copy. If if you don't have that skill yourself, a lot of authors can develop that. It's not that you know distant from them. <laughs> right, right. You know, I didn't know that Draft to Digital did to switch gears all of a sudden. Um, sure. I didn't know that Draft to Digital. To draft a digital, digital draft. A, that's hard to say. Draft to digital. No, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> draft to digital. <laughs> so in this disorder is hard to say. So no. It's. I didn't know you guys did movie. Yes, um, we, oh. for various reasons. <laughs> um, we at one time we we actually did distribute to Amazon. We don't we don't at the moment. It is on our list. We we will get back to Amazon um, for for various reasons. Though we, you know, Amazon is Amazon, and Amazon can be tough to work with uh, sometimes. Right. Um, so we're working on that. Um, but we do still convert to Mobi because one of the fundamentals of our service is that we do offer it all. It's all free. It's available to everyone. Um, if you register for a draft to digital account, you don't actually have to publish through us you can actually use our conversion tool and, and upload to Amazon. So, um, you know, of course, we would prefer that you distribute through us, uh, but we understand that's not possible in every venue, and it's not always desirable to do that. Um, a lot of our authors will convert their manuscript through us, go to Amazon, go to Kobo Direct, because, you know, Mark Lefebvre is an awesome guy, uh, or whatever their reason for wanting to do it, Mark Lefebvre is an awesome guy. But if you're, he, they, you know, people have all kinds of reasons for wanting to go direct, um, and uh, we don't discourage that. We uh, we make every tool, including that one, available so that authors can utilize it to their their best. 
uh, without having to pay any extra money. We only make money, by the way, from royalties. Uh, if you distribute through us, we take a 10% royalty. We, you know, that's the only way we make money. So we only make money when you make money, which is good for everybody. <laughs> when your interests and our interests align, that's good for everybody. Exactly, and I do think it's great that you guys offer the the service of converting to EPUB and MOBI without, and 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 still allowing the author to go ahead and and right. It. Well, because that's your book; it's your file, you know. And putting it behind some kind of weird paywall or something, and forcing you to have to use us um, to distribute or pay us for the file. I mean, that that's that doesn't honor the. Um, uh, the sort of verb, uh, not, ver not verbal, the sort of unspoken contract that we have with the author, which is, you know, we're there to help make your life easier, and that doesn't honor that. Um, it's much better. We feel like it's kind of better to, to give th that sort of thing away and create the goodwill from it um, so that you always know you can come back to us and we'll always help you. Um, we would... We can give you, all day long I can give you reasons why it's better to, to go wide in the long run. Um, and go wide, I mean wide distribution, not just distributing through uh, Amazon or whatever. Uh, but, you know, in the end it has to be your decision. We're not going to try to force anybody to make that decision, you know. Right. I don't know if you were in the session that I was at, at the San Francisco Writers Conference, but I heard Mark Cover talk about yeah. The, um, 10 publishing trends for 2017. I don't know. Yes, uh, I saw. I got to see part of it, and then I had to vacate to go do my session. But yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, one point he made at the end was that when you when you go exclusive with Amazon, then you hurt other book distributors, book book on online retailers like Kobo right. and like Barnes right. and Noble who won't be around right. if Amazon is the only game. And then right. the point that, that, that I made was that if you, were, if you have a, a financial advisor and if you asked him or her to put all your money into one stock, that person would say, you need a diversified por portfolio. That's right. And I would say the same thing is true with our books as our income, that we don't know yeah. what Amazon is going to do from one day to the next, but if we're diversified, then our income stream from our, our books are, is safer. That's right. Yeah, I compare it to, to stocks and investment all the time because it is very similar um, in concept because there are short-term gains you can you can gain, short-term benefits you can gain from going exclusive to Amazon's uh, KDB Select program. Um, but ultimately, that is the riskier option because Amazon is going to do what Amazon does. Amazon's best interests lie with Amazon, not with the authors. Um, they're always going to do what's best for their customers before they do what's best for the author. And so there's always going to be a danger. I mean, there was a story that released just yesterday, uh, and I don't remember the headline or anything. I'd be happy to look it up and share it with you later. But it's, you know, it was an author with, you know, uh, more than, I think he had at least a dozen books available. Um, Amazon, uh, someone decided to sort of game the system, uh, possibly an attack. Uh, and he saw a spike in page reads. You know, he had like 25,000 page reads in one day all of a sudden. And, uh, you know, he approached Amazon about it, but before anything could be done, they sent him an automatic, an automated reply that said he was being um, pulled from the site. And all of, his, all of his reviews disappeared, all of his books were pulled, everything went away. Wow. Um, he got it back a week or so later, but... You know, his sales went from, you know, say $25 a day for a given book to, you know, 18 cents a day for that book. So it, it did a lot of damage. Um, so this is a, this, that's a scary prospect that, you know, mm -hmm. if, if a large chunk of your revenue is coming from one source, you're at the whim of that source. Um, that's, and I don't, that's not me being a doomsayer, you know, not everyone's going to go through that. Uh, but I've seen that and other stories just like it. Um, a dozen times in the past six months. I mean, I've seen people complaining about all kinds of uh, slights and offenses uh, coming from the Amazon side. And um, Amazon is a great company. I, I love what they're doing. That that paper, you know, page read program that they have is has made some careers. Um, but I think that that's something you use strategically, not something you rely on for your entire income. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. 
Yeah. So people are so, often surprised. I, I will tell you I will tell people to use KDB Select as part of a strategy. Uh, put make your book exclusive for a short period. Um, but you know, it's fine to be exclusive, but always market wide. Always make sure you're out there talking to a global audience, not just Amazon's audience. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so you are an author in your own right, and you wrote a book about the 30-day author. I did, yes. The premise that you can write a book in 30 days. Were yes. you thinking of a nonfiction book, a fiction, or any book? Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> any book. Um, I, for instance, I wrote a 30-day author in 30 days. I actually wrote it in 15 days. Um, wow. Most of my fiction, most of my novels have been written in 15 days uh, with another 15-day polish uh, before going to, an, to uh, a group of editors and readers. Um, novels? Yeah, uh, all my novels. Oh, well, no, not all. I should not lie to you on air. <laughs> um, nice. I started doing this uh, around my third novel. I learned this, this as a practice, and then I boiled down what I had learned for 30-day uh, author so that people could um, learn this formula. And it's an actual formula I give people in the book. Um, and I don't limit it to the book, by the way. I will I, I, if I, for some reason, it's just blown right out of the top of my head. But I mean, the, the gist of the, of the formula is that you sit down and write a given number of words every single day. Uh, for the period of time you've allotted yourself. So it doesn't have to be a 30-day author formula. It could be a 15-day or a 7-day. It's just, it's really all about um, committing to putting those words down every day. Um, as you know, I mean, incre incremental progress is the way you get a book written. Uh, and coming back to it every single day is really the best way to make sure the story you're telling, whether it's a nonfiction book or fiction book, I mean, the story that you're telling needs to have a consistent voice, needs to have, uh, you know, it needs to feel like it's flowing, uh, can't have starts and stops. So this concept of waiting to write when you're inspired was always ridiculous. You know, it's never, that's never the way to write. I mean, you'll, you'll spend years <laughs> just writing your first manuscript. So that's, um, 30 Day Author was my attempt to kind of boil down what I was doing and what I was telling others, because uh, I did a bit of coaching on this. Um, just how to actually sit down and write a book in, in any given time frame. If you want to take a year to write a book, that's also okay. It's just that you're going to have a much better and more consistent product if you can come back to it every single day. So how much time do you devote to writing every day, and, how, and, and what word count do you strive for? Uh, so uh, I will change periodically my, my target word count to fit what I'm – what my goals are, um, but in general, you know, for a time I was aiming at 5,000 words a day. I still, I, wow. I still generally hit that each day, uh, but I've lowered my target. I have a bare minimum target um, to keep myself going, sort of a pot boiler target, which is around 500 words a day. That's my uh, life is busy. I'm sick. My wife's sick. Um, I've got lots of other projects in the fire. You know, that's my bare bones minimum. Uh, as long as I'm doing that, I know I'm making progress. But typically, I'll do 2,500 to 5,000 a day. On some days, I'll do 10,000 or more. Um, I have pushed myself to see how far I can go with this. I've done a 60,000 word novel in one day. Um, oh that day was done with uh, was finished with whiskey and sleeping, and uh, a few <laughs> more days of the same. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. For me, it would be tequila. Yeah, <laughs> whatever your your uh, stress eradicating beverage of choice might be, um, that's a good idea to have plenty of that around by the end of that day. But it's not, um, you know, it's not about massive word count. You know, I mean, it's we, the thing is, and those are quality words. That's not just me slapping down anything that comes in my head. Um, you know, I, I don't. I'm a pantser. Um, I don't. I don't plot my novels. I don't. I don't pre-plan. Um, some people might argue that I should. Some love it the way I do it. Uh, but the the key for me was always that I, I am a I, I've been a writer my whole life. You know, I've I've written professionally since I was 12 years old. I just tap into that skill. That's a practiced skill. 
Um, if you have not been doing that since you were 12 or uh, have not developed a consistent daily writing habit, by no means should you feel bad that you're not putting 5,000 or even 2,500 words down each day. Your goal is to simply put down a minimum word count every day so that while you are you know, working out the premise, while you are working out the characters, you know, you're, you're using the language, you're using this tool and this resource, and that you're making incremental progress, and that's the whole point. I don't, by the way, judge people who plot and plan. I, I think that's a, a fabulous skill that I wish I had. <laughs> I've just nev never been quite that good at it. I don't do that. I'm also a cancer. I don't do that either. Yeah. It, just, it, it doesn't work for me. I, I will have a sort of a, a rough idea, like for nonfiction, a rough idea of, of a table of contents and then go from right. there. But and I think that's fine. Nothing. Yeah. I think especially in, in nonfiction, uh, you tend to know the points of what you're trying to do. Um, and, you know, nonfiction writers tend to do a lot of presentation. Um, so those skills come into play. You're able to organize that information and if you've if you've got it down you know I've talked to a thousand nonfiction authors um, who can do this because they've given this presentation at a thousand different venues um, if you know your topic that well you've probably already got an outline honestly <laughs> you've probably got a PowerPoint or something that you've used a million times and all you're doing is expanding on it so. yeah so it was it Honoré Quarter wrote your foreword, right? Yes, she's an amazing so she woman. I love Honoré. I don't know if, if, if you want to explain who she is to the audience. Um, when I met her, met her at the so there's a there's a uh, annual summit in Austin, Texas that's now called the Smarter Artist Summit. Uh, we actually attended the first version of it, which was called the Colonist Summit. Um, put on by the guys who run the self-publishing podcast um, and their company is Sterling and Stone. Uh, we attended at the same time, uh, we did not know each other prior to that, but you know that was such a, uh, it was a great uh, conference, it was small, uh, very tight knit, we did a sort of uh, a hot seat where everyone got to sit down and chat and talk about uh, their careers and their goals and that sort of thing. Um, she at that point had just started doing some work with um, Hal Elrod, who is the author of Miracle Morning, and uh, I had literally just before the conference had read that book. I was getting up at four in the morning because of that book um, every day, and uh, I still am. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I was implementing the things I had learned from that, and she was actually co-authoring some stuff with him at that point. And then she created the um, Prosperity for Writers uh, Mastermind. And we did a whole, I did. I was one of her seminar or whatever, uh, it was like a course kind of thing, but we, I was one of the participants of that. I was one of the people featured in her book. You know, we, we established a pretty good relationship and we had a lot of back and forth. So when I wrote this book, I'd actually been working on it uh, when I started that conference and had put it aside uh, because I'd had this realization that I, would, I did not want to be, per se, I did not want to be a nonfiction author. I, I wanted to be a fiction author, and until I got a grip on that part of my business, um, I needed to set that book aside. So I did. Um, I still say it's written in 30 days because I wrote it. <laughs> I have my, I track all my word counts and my days spent on a book, and so I can see how many days I spent actually writing. So total, it was like 30. Um, it was less than 30, actually. It was like 15. Um, Wow. But when I showed her the book, she liked the concept. She she herself has since published a book called uh, "You Must Write a Book," which I contributed to. Um, and uh, you know, we have very similar ideologies. Uh, she's more nonfiction than fiction, and and that works out just fine. So yeah, it was a great fit. Yeah, I heard her on a podcast. I don't I don't remember which one it is, but she's also a prolific writer. And I she is. That yeah. When she started writing blog posts for other people and having uh, ghost writing, ghost writing for yeah. others and having to be fast to, to make, make the most money out of the gig. So. Right. Right. Yeah. She, uh, I mean, I can't speak for her career per se, but I can say that, um, yeah, she is quite prolific. She's, you know, and she's very energetic, much more so than me. Um, and she's now got, 
uh, some sort of relationship with Amazon, um, which is is working well for her. So you know, you'll you'll see her pop up in these like Amazon uh, webinars and and ads and stuff now. Uh, so she's doing great, you know. And you know, we're still tight. We uh, we text each other every now and then. In fact, I as we were chatting, I just saw a text pop up from her, <laughs> so, which I'll have to get to in a moment. But yeah. yeah. So how do you balance? We are going to get to your marketing tips, but I want to just ask you, how do you balance your your RV life because you downside down, downsize yes. to an RV, and so yes. tra traveling and writing and doing some copywriting and working for Draft to Digital. Yes. <laughs> and writing books in fifteen to thirty and days. Writing books. Yes. <laughs> and How doing do you all that into a, I don't know, a time capsule. Um. So uh, I have a time machine. Um, I'm not supposed to tell anyone about it. It runs on uranium. No, the the actual. I mean, we're. The thing is, I. It's hard to explain sometimes uh, because people want me to answer that question with, um, I use this app or I use you know, this this method uh, that I've read about. But the truth is, um, I I use the simplest tools to make to make my life work. I use a calendar. I use the calendar app on Apple. And I use the reminder app on Apple, and uh, I just I make a list of the tasks that I know I need to accomplish each day, and I set timelines for for all that stuff, and I just do the work. Um, a lot of what I do, I always always try to uh, combine tasks so that I can do double output for the for the same effort. So, for example, um, in the marketing work I do. For draft to digital, I know my strengths, and I know I know what I'm good at. Um, I'm good at connecting people. I'm good at uh, things like this, you know, talking to people. I'm a natural talker, if you you may have uh, guessed, and uh, you know, and I'm good at, at going to like conferences and that sort of thing. And all these things were things that were necessary for draft to digital. So, I I do all those things for them. Um, it has the side benefit of putting my name out there too. So that's that's good. I'm doing a little bit of double duty there, uh, but I make sure that I always put first things first, as they say. And, and uh, I think that's a, one of the seven habits of highly successful people. I think um, put first things first. I make sure because you know, draft to digital. I got to do so much marketing for them each day. So as long as I can hit that number, then I'm good. I, I know that I need to do so many words per day to keep up my output for my my own writing. And as long as I do that, I'm good. Um, and there's a nice little balance there. At the end of the day, I'm pretty tired, just like anyone who works hard all day. But uh, I feel good about my accomplishments, so <laughs> it energizes me for the next round. So, do you write? Do you write your writing time into your calendar? Uh, kind of, um, because I know my hours. I know which hours work well for me. I get up at four in the morning. Um, and I, you know, I take the dog out. I get, I get ready for my day. I do a little bit of planning, um, and then I generally I'm very fast when I write. So I know that if I can start earlier, I'll be done earlier, and I can get on to other things. So um, I'll typically do, you know, 2,500 to 5,000 words in a couple of hours. That's that's generally my writing time. Um, and then after that. I, I, I try to start no later than 9 a.m. I, I don't try that. I always start no later than 9 a.m. I end up starting a lot earlier sometimes uh, for drafted digital's work. Um, and that's that's mostly because around that time, everyone in the country is more or less awake, um, at least East Coast through Central. And uh, I can start, you know, making phone calls or tapping people through social media or, you know, emails or that sort of thing and start getting results. Um, and then throughout the day, um, I, I kind of fill in any gaps, you know, with anything that's left. So if I know I have a blog post to write, uh, I set aside time. I'll put that on my calendar. Um, write blog, write blog post X, you know, write guest post X, uh, appear on podcast X, and I'll I'll schedule all that. The calendar rules. If it's not on the calendar, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so the only thing I don't put on the calendar is my writing time because I typically have that done before I even start the day. Oh, I see. 
And so how do you factor in driving time? Because you're also traveling. So we tend to only drive on, on sort of off days. Um, I might occasionally leave like on a Friday or something. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll drive over weekends um, to, to keep from interfering with the work. Uh, if we're right. doing something that's more vacation oriented, you know, I just build in some vacation time or whatever. But uh, it's not, I don't know, it actually doesn't come up. I mean, it's if I know i got to be somewhere by a certain time, I can plan ahead and get there. Um, we rarely say uh, on a on a Tuesday I gotta be in you know uh, a state three states over by Thursday and then have to drive. That rarely ever happens. <laughs> so I usually know a few months ahead of time that I need to be on the other coast or whatever, um, and so I plan accordingly. If if it's you know if it's something I'm doing for Draft to Digital, I, I will you know that's just part of the work day. You know I. I get up, I do my writing, and I knock out any emails or whatever I can, and then we get on the road. And you know, it's not unheard of for me to do a ten or twelve hour day of driving just to, you know, get somewhere in time to set up and, and relax a bit and start a, a normal work day the next day. I mean, I've done that before too. So, just yeah. it's a balancing so, act. <laughs> and then you have book marketing because your books have been very successful. And I'm wondering, yeah. what, what do you think makes them as successful as they have been? Is it partly the um, genre? Is it just the style of writing? It is partly the genre. I will admit that since switching genres from science fiction to um, thrillers, I've had a much easier time with book marketing. Um, the, uh, I do um, I utilize Facebook ads for some of my marketing, although I'm not as good at it as some people. I mean, there are some people who are just phenomenal at this, uh, but I do some targeted Facebook ads. Uh, I'm starting to do a lot more targeted um, Amazon ads, and I just had a conversation with Brian Meeks uh, about this. Um, he's got something special in the works that I won't spoil, but he's an expert on Amazon ads that I, I uh, kind of turn to every now and then, or I have turned to in the past. Um, I do a lot of you know social media and that sort of thing, um, but the the best the best tool I've found for marketing, of course, has been the mailing list and People yes. roll their eyes and, and vomit in their mouths a little when you say this, but I mean the truth is that is the best. It is just proven that that email marketing is has always been the best marketing tool. Um, I spent years building my email list. A lot of money that I spent on advertising, especially on Facebook, over the past say four four or five years, uh, I'd say ninety eight percent of the money I've spent on marketing has been in building this list. So that when I have a new release, um, I don't have to depend on Amazon or you know Apple or anyone else to promote my book. I can go and promote it myself to about twenty six thousand people. That's no small uh, measure, you know. And not everyone buys the book, uh, of course. And sometimes you got to hit them again. And you know, people people do crazy things like unsubscribe or mark you as spam, despite having. <laughs> <laughs> chosen your list and gotten all your free stuff and uh, uh, so there's a there's a little bit of uh, maintenance and management that goes into that but you know that's that's been the the best tool um, for marketing my work I yeah I have yet to land like a, a book bub promotion and if you haven't heard of that I mean they they have their own mailing list I've yet to do that um, I know plenty of people who have I'm lazy about it so I haven't done it yet uh, but the but getting something like that would be very beneficial. I just haven't put the I haven't made that a priority. Um, but the majority of my marketing, I think, largely it happens with uh, the email list. Um, it's the best. That's the best place I have. So I have lots of little tricks that I use uh, while I'm moving around in the world. <laughs> you know, like I'll do events, um, but I feel like. Even if you do live events, you you typically don't get the kind of return on it that you might expect. Uh, so my advice to people is do that more for studying your audience uh, and studying you know the markets that you're trying to reach rather than trying to sell to those markets directly. Take what you're learning from uh, making appearances. If you're going to go do a book signing at Barnes and Noble, for example, you know I've I've done book signings in all kinds of places, uh, schools, libraries, bookstores, uh, you know, outside of coffee shops, that sort of thing. And and um, 
I can't say that I've made a ton of sales in any of these things, but what I can say is when I walk away from that, I understand my audience a lot better. And so it helps me shape camp, you know, advertising campaigns and the like and uh, get a lot more out of them. So that's, a, that's pretty good market research. So what do you offer as a giveaway, as an enticement to join your email list? I have at various times offered different books, but I largely offer books. Uh, however, uh, right now uh, you can actually get my my first thriller for free if you uh, if you sign up on my website. And that so that's my top of funnel incentive. However, um, what I'm going to do next, and I'm working on this, I'm going to create something that is specific to people who get on my mailing list. Um, I just feel like that's going to I've I've done a little bit of research on this but in general um, people are going to respond better and you're going to get higher quality leads if you offer something that they can't get anywhere else uh, there's something built into us that says I want the thing you know I, I must own the thing that I can't get unless I get on this mailing list and that's that's the cost um, so I'm thinking of a novella maybe tied to my most popular uh, thriller series um, which which taps into the same market, so people who buy my books and enjoy Dan Kotler uh, can get a Dan Kotler story that they can't get anywhere else. Um, I'm actually thinking of trying one and then possibly bundling um, two or three because uh, you know more is better when it comes to this landscape. So maybe three short novellas in the end that you download as one or three downloads, maybe. And I might have I might use these things to start segmenting the list a bit more too because I still write other uh, genres um, so I was thinking I might do a, a, a pivotal book for each major series I have and then people getting on the list get on a specific list they get on my main list uh, but they also get on a specific list geared towards science fiction or I have a YA fantasy series that I uh, that I push and then you know they'll get all the general emails, but they'll also get some stuff that's specifically for them. And I think that's a, I think that's a better way to do it than I've done it in the past. <laughs> Great. And so I have one more question, but I thought I'd see if anybody has a question out there. So if you have sure. a question, just write it in the message area, and then if anybody. Asks I hope I didn't mess anything that up by accidentally starting this set in the. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, the yeah, you did. webinar. I have a question, which is, so for someone who's just starting out, and they're about to publish their first book, what would you think? What would you tell them they need to think about or do as they're preparing to market their first book? Um, I mean, you the 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 standards are uh, the basic stuff is uh, you you have to actually uh, make sure the book is ready for prime time. Um, there's a concept called, uh, that we use called um, minimal viable product, uh, which gets misconstrued quite a bit. But what you want is your book to be at the its top shape that you're capable of making it. So if you can afford to pay, to pay an editor, pay an editor. Um, if the best you can do is to get your family and friends to read the book and give you feedback on typos and that sort of thing, then do that. Uh, but the the sort of first step for me is to get the book ready. Uh, as ready as you're capable of getting it. If you're gonna, if you're gonna self-publish, if you're gonna traditionally publish, you still want to do that, but your goals are a little different on the back end. So you can, you can choose a different um, deliverable <laughs> of sorts. <laughs> um, yeah. Other tips. I mean, you, have, you want to, uh, as an indie author, you want to get a really good cover. Uh, make sure that you're, you know hiring someone who can design your cover. If you are a designer yourself, there is nothing wrong with designing your own covers. I design all my own covers. Uh, but I also have a design background. So I'm not, I, and sometimes, by the way, I screw up my covers. You know, sometimes I have terrible covers. So uh, I'm not immune to this. But it, if you can afford to pay someone to do it, that's another, that's another thing to put your money into. Um, I don't like telling authors to spend money when they're just starting out, but there are some things <laughs> like editing and cover design that are worth it if you can get the cash uh, flowing on that. Um, you want to start building your platform uh, as, as early as you can, as quickly as you can, but uh, start 
even before you've published your book. Start getting out there and, and you know, if it takes writing some short stories um, and uh, on your blog, for example, or on Medium or Wattpad or something like that, and then you know, at the end of each, getting people to you know, offering people one of these free unique short stories, like we mentioned before, to come get on your mailing list. Uh, use a service like Mailchimp to collect those email addresses, and build constantly. That is your that is your marketing for the first, you know year or two of, of being an author. You can do all kinds of other crazy stuff, but if you're not concentrating on building that mailing list, you're probably not going to go far uh, very quickly. So do that. Um, I would also recommend that if your goal is to, to advance quickly advance quickly as an author, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that, that, that authors do that move them ahead faster. One is always be working on the next book. Your best marketing tool is your next book. Um, that's because when readers discover you, they're excited and they want to see more. So if you have a back catalog of books, there's a lot of opportunity for them to spend their money with you. Uh, that's that's desirable. Um, you should uh, uh, so that you're writing more books. What was the other uh, the other point? May have just blown out of my brain, but you want to make sure that you are um, talking to your audience as a human being first, not not a salesperson. You know, you want to make sure that you are um, uh, constantly uh, sort of uh, sticking with the same genre. That's the one I was trying to remember. You want to make sure that you're staying in the same lane, because authors who bounce around a lot in genres move slower. And there's nothing wrong with being a cross-genre writer, but it, it's going to take longer. Trust me, my career is exactly that. It took a lot longer uh, because I wrote across genres, um, because your readers want to know that they can come to you and they can get the consistency of the type of story they're after. So you want to you want you don't want to disappoint that expectation. <laughs> so uh, so constantly stick to the same genre if you can, but write write books, write tons and tons of books. I mean, there is no better writing advice. You know, as you build your platform, give your readers more and more and more, and and just keep doing it. Good advice from a blockbuster best-selling author and marketing director from Draft to Digital. Thank you. How did that sound? Yes, that sounded great. And uh, you know, the, the important part of this conversation for me is Draft to Digital because that helped me uh, personally to to build the life that I have uh, in multiple ways. I was already because of Draft to Digital, I was already moving into this lifestyle. Thanks to Draft to Digital, it was much easier for me to get here. Uh, so you know, I, I have I have to give praise where praise is due. Not to not to turn it into a sales pitch at the very end, but you should definitely check into Draft Digital if your goal is to distribute widely around the world. We can take care of that for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank you for coming on the call today. Of course, of course, and yes. It's just been such a pleasure talking with you and getting to meet you virtually at least. Yes, and I'm so sorry we did not get to meet at the conference. We'll be there. Will be others. That was a good yeah, conference. <laughs> All right. I blame that conference for being sick. <laughs> oh, you do? That happens. Oh, yeah. I got sick before the conference, so. Oh, it's you then. No, it was me. I was, I was healed. I was fine <laughs> at the conference. That's fine. That's so, fine. So thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you for You're everyone who attended. Welcome. Goodbye. <laughs>